18 months ago, Time Team discovered under this Gloucestershire field what may be one of the largest Roman villas yet excavated in Britain. We found whole ranges of rooms, including a beautiful bathhouse, arranged around three courtyards spreading all over this plateau. But at the end of the three days, just when we thought we finally understood the villa, Geophysics came up with another whole range of buildings running all the way up that hillside. Could this simply mean that the villa was even larger than we'd originally thought? Or was there something rather extraordinary happening here 1,600 years ago? Time Team just had to come back to Turk Dean to find out. This is what the site looked like at the beginning of our dig last year. And what an amazingly clear picture it was. The ground plan of a hitherto undiscovered Roman villa was there as a network of parch marks in the grass. Oh, look oh, at it's that. It's quite clearly laid out, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yeah. It hasn't disappeared. And there's more stuff down here, look. Yeah. And then there's a corner down there. Okay, yeah. clear that. Oh, and look at these buildings down here, look. They're separate, actually, from the main building, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, well, they should be down towards... And there's something there by the spring, look. But that wasn't the half of it. Over the next three days, as we opened trench after trench, the villa got bigger and bigger, until by the end of our three days, it seemed to cover the whole plateau and beyond, as geophysics came up with a whole new range of buildings. It's <laughs> another wing, it's another corridor, <laughs> and it's going right up to the hill. I've put a ranging pole on the top oh, that's okay. about two so is it a villa? meters wide. Well, no, wait a minute, that's, it's that's the by the front. spring. That's near it's the another, spring. Yeah, that's that's a, one at a time, one at a time. It was unbelievable stuff. But time ran out on us, and the new range remained unexcavated. Until now. One year on, we've come back for a second crack at unlocking the mysteries of this site. Over the past few days, everyone's been speculating about what we might have got here. Some yeah. people say that it's probably a villa that was built at a different time during the Roman period. Yeah. Some people are saying it could be a temple because yeah. it was built near a spring, yeah. so it could be a ritual site. Other people are saying that it might just be part of the original villa, a sort of granny wing. Yeah. What is it? Well, it could be any of those. So how are we going to find out? Well, we dig, of course, you know, we dig some trenches. Where? Ah, well, you wait till you see the geophysics. Okay. <laughs> John and Chris have, in fact, done a lot more work on the whole site over the last year, and they've produced a completely new set of results. Oh, it looks as if you've nearly done the whole of Gloucestershire. <laughs> <laughs> Feels like it as well. <laughs> That's where we did the survey last year, Tony, the main villa on the plateau. And you remember we had the arm coming out. We've now expanded over the whole of the half of the hillside. And well, I mean, we've got what appears to be a, a building here. Yeah. A big area of noise um, that looks industrial. Uh, and then individual anomalies that, well, we're not quite sure, could be kilns. What's all that going up there? Well, this we're not sure whether it's a modern land drain, stone line drain, or if that is a spring line, yeah. whether it's something to do with water courses. <laughs> uh, Maybe up to a shrine or something. <laughs> there's there's, there's <laughs> actually dozens of things we could do here, isn't there? Well, <laughs> In the end, Mick decides to start with just two targets. Phil's going to take trench one into the aisled building and Carenza trench two into the industrial area. And on this bitterly cold October morning, we're off. Last year, we found walls just inches under the surface, and there's an air of nervous anticipation as the machines get to work. No one's more anxious than Wilf Musto, the landowner. And hey, presto. That's it. Just all you've got to do is just take the turf off and you're down onto it. Look at that. Look at it. Within minutes, there's abundant stonework in both trenches. We're on the trail. Look, 
Last year, you used a great phrase about this site. You said there might be a ritual component. I did, yes. That means, what, a temple, I suppose? Yes. Why did you come to that conclusion? Well, we were starting to think, given the proximity of the site to the springs, that there may actually be some kind of ritual focus around that. Rather People like coming to worship at the springs. That's right. Yeah. I mean, a very similar kind of site, focusing on a spring, has recently been discovered at Swindon, where you've got a steep hillside with a whole series of terraces, springs, probable shrines around each of these springs, and this water then being carried away down through a much larger complex, which is probably like the centre for the pilgrims and those who are coming to worship at the site. However, having seen the rest of the geophysics here now, there, there are no obvious structures that one would point to and say a temple. On the contrary, we've got some very clearly domestic looking structures such as this aisled building and other areas of activity. So it looks now as if what we've got is a villa which is the centre of a large estate with its ancillary structures. If Mark's right, then the new range of buildings could provide some really unusual archaeology. We'll be digging into the infrastructure of a villa estate, workshops, slave quarters, and possibly even small shrines. But first things first, we need evidence the new range is actually Roman. And in Trench 2, Carenza thinks she has it. But we've got a very small coin oh, from yes. there, which is rather nice. Take a look at that. Well, I can tell from the size almost straight away, and it's going to be considerably smaller than my fingernail. Uh, that is something that's called a minim, uh, which means literally be, yes. tiny. It's the like the 5p piece these days, oh, no, you always e lose all it's the time. E it's even worse than that, I and mean, they probably <laughs> use them in, in bags, hundreds and hundreds of them actually in a bag. It's the sort of thing, if you drop that, you wouldn't even bother to pick it up. We are Late looking fourth. at 4th century activity. Brilliant. It's Roman, and it's the same date, 4th century, as the villa. And taken with a growing collection of slag fragments, it's beginning to look as if this area was some kind of workshop. Though there's a way to go before we'll know what was made here. In Trench 1, meanwhile, an impressively crisp structure is emerging from the ground. Blimey, Mix using a shovel, you must be excited. <laughs> Mr Harding's clear up man I I've got to keep him in training, you see. <laughs> hey, this looks something good, isn't it? It's amazing, isn't it? Get him coming here. Yeah, yeah, come clean yeah. up. Yeah. We've got a superb end of a building. Yeah. Just soak down it. Yeah. This is what the archaeologists have started referring to as an aisled barn. Apparently a common feature on large villa sites, probably used for storing farm produce or livestock. And it too is producing fines. Oh, well, we've got some um, coins. Yeah. Mark's got some coins over here. Yeah, we've had five mm. coins so far come out. A couple of them are actually rather nice. Let's um, have a look at them. Lost it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Day one and we've lost, lost our first find. Mike, <laughs> bring the machine <laughs> over. <laughs> Mike. Yeah. We've lost. We lost a <laughs> find. I've been over yeah. there and have walked back this way. It's it's the Constantinopolis. <laughs> that way! Ah, there. Hey! Hey! <laughs> Second time today. Yeah. We're, We're never so going to live that down. Oh, We're never going to live that down. That, what is it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a commemorative issue it's a lost from coin. <laughs> about 330 to 35 AD, issued to mark the foundation of Constantinople yeah. as the new capital of the Roman so Empire. So 300s again. And, and we've got another one here, which is slightly later, dates to between the period of about 364, 375 AD and shows a figure of victory in the legend Securitas Republica, the safety of the state. And does that compare well with what we had last year? Yeah, it's, exa it's very <laughs> consistent, very consistent with last yeah. year. I suppose that's good because it now ties both our buildings into the Villa Estate. But I must admit I'd hope to find something a bit more exciting than a barn. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, but at least we've got lots more targets, and John and Chris are taking a closer look at the next one. The strange blob they thought might be a kiln. But that doesn't look kiln-like. No, it doesn't, does it? I mean, those, those responses, that might be a rubbish pit, but I, it's not a kiln. Huge rubbish pit? Yeah, I guess. Or a Ford Cortina 20 metres down. Again. There's only one way to find out, and in no time, our third trench is underway. 
we know that in the third and fourth century there was this fantastic Roman villa covering mm. this entire plateau. But what were the Romans doing, building here, stuck out in the wilds of Gloucestershire? Well, it wasn't really the wilds of Gloucestershire. In Roman times, this was one of the richest agricultural parts of the province. We're right down in the settled southern part of Britain. We're not very far away from that great Roman city at Cirencester, which was the second biggest city in Roman Britain. And when the Romans invaded, the way they ruled was to hand the land back to the local bigwigs, the local tribal aristocrats, because that's how you got things to run. You'd set them up as the local Romans. By giving them back their own land, that gave them the qualification to sit on the town council. In that position, they could run the local economy, run the local society in the way that they wanted and passed it up for themselves. So the guy who owned this villa was a local bloke pretending to be a Roman, all dressed up. We don't know that for certain, but it's a real probability that the chap and his family who lived here could trace their ancestry back through generations to the tribal leaders of this part of the world when the Romans arrived. But it was a golden age. It was. I mean, this is a really exceptional house, one of many exceptional houses in this part of Britain, and they enjoyed a top end of Roman living. We excavated some evidence of that living last year in the main villa. There was the ornate bathhouse with fantastic painted plaster on the inside. We also got plenty of jewellery, including this lovely brooch. And the site was full of high status pottery. This year, we can add to that list. We found an inhabitant. John, who is this man you're dressed as? Well, if you can imagine, the Romans were here for 400 years. We always get the impression of them wearing sandals and you know, the whole thing. Well, at about the end of the Roman Empire, this is what your average well-to-do Roman would be wearing. Um, no more sandals, we're looking at closed-in boots, perones, nice and warm. Early on in the Empire, the Romans were very derogatory about the Celts and the Germanics wearing trousers. They called them bracati, very derisive term. But once again, by the end uh, of the period, they're wearing them because they're practical. And on a day like this, you can understand why. Is this how it's supposed to go? Well, you... ah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing! Excellent. And this is from the same period too, presumably. Is it comfortable? It, it's a bit bulky. I mean, I don't know how easily you'd be able to move about really something practical. It's not too cold, though I have got jeans on underneath at the moment, so I don't know what it would be like. It's a bit drafty around the ankles, I must say. Well, if she hadn't been wearing her Roman jeans, what would she have been wearing <laughs> under her dress? They would have worn Roman underwear. They would have been um, linen bloomers, basically. They found a pair of Roman knickers, didn't they? Well, they've got leather it? knickers from London. But I don't it, think they're yes, worn by yeah. everybody. They'd be jolly uncomfortable. Leather knickers? <laughs> leather knickers, now there's a thing. These days, Phil's prone to wearing strange costumes too. His bad back means he has to kneel rather than squat when he's scraping, and his delicate knees need protection. But it's worth the effort, because in Trench 1, the barn is taking a turn for the better. God, there's a lot going on in here, aren't there? In particular, we're getting some intriguing and very unbarn like finds. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> Look at that. These are just two of the five mosaic fragments we've found so far, nearly double last year's haul. And Phil's pulling out bits of domestic pot all over the place. Oh, look at that. That is a nice This is the rim of a storage jar. And this is part of a mortarium, a bowl used for preparing food. How are we doing date wise? Well, we're looking at something that's possibly second century, judging by is that it, round it. As early as that? Well, I'd, I have to, I can't be absolutely certain, but it's, it's certainly not into the fourth century. You're aging your bets. The third century, <laughs> third, third century, <laughs> well, no, no, no. I know your time. <laughs> looking for a quick answer. I don't think, we're, we're not looking at something that's fourth century, we're looking at something that's third century or before. The jar would have been about two feet high, used for storing oil or spices. And the mortarium, which turned out to be 3rd century, would have looked like this. Great stuff, but if this is, as the archaeologists believe, a barn, how come we're finding lots of domestic material in it? There's mystery in the Trench 2 workshop as well. No one can tell whether this mass of stones is wall or floor. And we still don't know what kind of work went on here. 
To find out, we'll have to lift the stones. But before we do, they've got to be scrupulously recorded. So Carenza has moved on to Trench 3, the one on the blob, where she seems to have found neither Kiln nor Cortina. And this looks like clay. It looks like clay from down here as well, actually. So is there anything there at all? Well, yeah, there is. We, we've got an edge here. See, we've got a lot of stones in the edge here, and there's pink here suggesting it's, there's been heat or burning, yeah. um, changing the colour of the limestone. We're in the sort of bottom left-hand quadrant of that big circular blob. So like the rest of it goes up right round there behind you and down sort of just behind us. What do you think it might be? So it could either be the lime kiln to make the mortar for the Roman buildings down there, or it could equally well be something from the Middle Ages where they're robbing the remains of the Roman villa, reducing it to, to, to uh, lime to take off for mortar in the churches and manor houses around here. But Mick's attention is soon drawn back to the Isled building in Trench 1. The domestic fines, and now a layer of plaster on the floor, have set him thinking. Well, we've got four or five tesserae from it now. We've got a lot of plaster and mortar in the bottom of it. So, you know, it's it, it probably not an agricultural building as far, you know, from that. And we've got some nice pottery. So what well. do you think it could be? Well, I, I mean, it just crossed my mind. It might be, you know, where the main house was, perhaps. Well, that would be a bit different. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we didn't get much like that last year, so, you know, I mean, there ought to be something that's a bit, bit more domestic and house-like here somewhere. So far from being dull, the aisled structure in Trench 1 could be the most important building on the whole site. You'd have thought, then, that Mick would be hard at work here proving his theory. But he's not. He's 100 yards away up here, opening a fourth trench. What's going on? Let me show you on the map. Um, this is the... Let's get it the right way round. We're like that. There's our trench one, trench two, trench three. And we've got these whole series of springs across the side of the hill, of which there's one down there, one right up the top over there. And we're actually digging in this one here. How do you know there's springs? Well, that one, the, the farmer's piped water out of it. That one's still got water out of it. And this one's actually a little hollow with a platform on it. And it looks as if that probably was actually a spring. Yeah. And we're interested in these because not only was there a water supply needed for the buildings, but these are the sort of places you get uh, shrines or, or offertory places. They're ritual centers, in fact. What sort of thing might you expect to find then? Well, we might find a structure over the top, or we might so find offerings dropped into it. So we're back into ritual again. I thought we'd knock that one on the head. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's, it's always a likely function for sites like this. You yeah. know, that's... The nearby villa at Chedworth, for instance, that was dug in Absolutely, the 19th yeah. century, has a little yeah. nymphaeum built around the spring. Well, I'm going to give you till lunchtime. All right. Mick wants to track the whole water system. So in addition to Trench 4 here, he's opened up a fifth right up here where, according to local rumour, the springs actually rise. And he thinks this hollow could be a platform for a shrine. So he's got Mick the Dig hunting for signs of water and ritual. Meanwhile, we're planning some ritual activity of our own. We're going to build a Roman altar and dedicate it to Dea Fortuna, the goddess of good fortune, who we're pretty sure has helped us uncover this site. Guy's composed a dedication to Dea Fortuna from Time Team with thanks. But there's a dispute about the Latin translation. It's very difficult to find Latin for Time Team. Time is tempus, which we've cut down we've to, to temp yes. here. But what we use for team is a bit, is a bit more difficult. I've chosen Grex because it's four letters and it fits very neatly with our inscription. <laughs> but it's a slightly sort of a time a gang four. or time yeah. band is what. But, but Lindsay doesn't like that. What, 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 she, she wants a more flattering name. It is a four-letter word. It is rather derogatory when used for human beings. <laughs> well, what are you going for? A herd of sheep or something like that. <laughs> well, I think. Do you see yourself as athletes or gladiators? Because perhaps manners might be better. Oh, good Lord, I don't know that I see myself <laughs> as an athlete. And, and Mick, certainly, no way. No, we stick with gang. Or <laughs> 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 Lindsay and I are going to go fight it out over a Latin dictionary. Yeah. <laughs> and it looks like the goddess approves. 
This is trench one, our mystery trench, the one that could prove to be the key to the whole site. Originally, we thought it was probably some sort of Roman barn with great aisles running through it. But then last night, Mick had the idea that it could actually be a high status building. Phil, what is it? It most certainly is a high status building. I mean, look, we've got plastered walls on the outside. And, look, and most amazingly, they're painted. You wouldn't get that on a barn. You would most you? certainly would not. The evidence is stacking up. But we'll need more than plaster on an exterior wall before we can call this building a villa. So there's still plenty of digging to do. As we dig, the finds keep coming, and all of them are reassuringly domestic. I quite like this stripy stuff. Look inside my jumper. There's plenty enough to keep the local school children busy. A layer of charcoal in the Trench 3 pit confirms its use as a kiln, but there's no chance of dating it. And the stonework in Trench 2 is several layers thick, and it doesn't look like we'll ever untangle it. So Mick decides to close them both. How are you getting on here, Vaughan? Oh, wow, wow. that's amazing. Found... Good grief, Gosh. something. That's flowing under there, isn't it? It certainly is. Can we get the capstones off? Yeah. Yeah. Can I help it? Be careful they don't fall in. Yeah. Don't fall in. Yeah. Got it. <laughs> now, can I give you a hand with this one? Yeah, you can see, isn't that clear, yeah. the water in there? And look how deep it all is. Well, I'm just thinking, my old question with this was whether it was anything to do with the Roman occupation here, David. Well, do you think that's possible? Would you I, get I, I think it, like I think it's highly likely. Really? I mean, you'd expect a water supply to feed, uh, to feed the villa. It's an awful but lot of scale built up was, on the sides. There here. was something very similar to this discovered at Woodchester, really? which was definitely Roman, and the water was still flowing through it. Like this is flowing Such a through here. Such as you see here. And it's very deep within the section, isn't it? It I mean, is. It's got a good... That's the level at which it's cut in, and there's a good two-thirds of a metre of soil that's above right. it. That's right. So it, it, is, it is very likely it could be Roman. However, Trench 5, the supposed source of the spring, is still barren of archaeology, so we've no idea yet where the water comes from. But John and Chris think they know where it goes to. This anomaly here, that's the stone conduit, and it comes down and then actually in at that point, and the white splodge is where we couldn't get the probes into the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this coincides with the back of the building that we're excavating over there. And what we've marked what we think is the back line. Mm. And it's this line of canes yeah. here. Yeah. And so you've got the front of the building down there yeah. and the back wall approximately here. It's a massive building, yeah, isn't it? It, it is. is a big you building. Imagine it right all that lot there. But they're not going to build right adjacent to the spring, are, are they? We're not going to get both in one trench. Well, we? we, well probably the, not, but we want to look, look at, at the, the plot, spring first. We think this is the back wall here, yeah. and there may be an arm going down to the spring. So John and Chris think they've found not only the other end of the aisle building, but a possible link between it and the spring outflow. And Mick, in fact, decides to open two new trenches. Trench 6A, from the corner of the building to the spring outflow, and Trench 6B, further along, to establish the other corner. By lunchtime, we've got diggers hard at work in five trenches across the site. First with the breakthrough is David in Trench 1, at the bottom end of the aisled building. Yesterday, uh, this morning rather, we had a piece of red plaster yeah, falling from yeah, that, saw that wall, yeah. which we thought was external rendering. Yeah. Well, now we've coming across this uh, larger oh, pieces of crikey. painted plaster. Well, you've got about four colours on that, have you? That's right. Looks like black, white, red, red and, and, and blue. And blue. That's cool. right. But there are deposits all over here, look. It's obviously fallen off this wall, and what we thought was an outside wall yeah. clearly probably isn't. <laughs> so the chances are that these are deposits of fallen wall plaster, and underneath this, we're going to find a floor. Oh. Or yeah. even a mosaic. 
Yeah. And then the room is probably quite large. How far we don't know for sure, but it extends quite a way in this direction, I suspect, yeah. to the south. Yeah. And then possibly as as far back as as roughly here. So it's it's heading towards the excavations last year. Towards then, the building the excavations last year. Last year. Right. right. And then in this direction, I suspect the northern wall is a continuation of this wall here. But I a high status room with plaster just about clinches this as a villa. Right. That's cracking, isn't it? It is, it's marvellous. <laughs> and it gets better. It turns out it's even older than the 4th century house we found last year. This is material that has come from a great big deposit of soil that predates the construction of this stone building. And it's all consistently late 2nd to early 3rd century AD, probably no later than about 240 AD. We've got this large mortarium, this mixing bowl from the Oxford region. The rim form is typical of a type that dates to the late 2nd, early 3rd century AD. We've got evidence for milling on a perhaps industrial scale with this very large millstone. You can see the rilling on the edge here, probably from Yorkshire, millstone grit. We've got part of a tankard for drinking out of. This is a classic 2nd and 3rd century form in the Severn Valley. And we've also got pieces of decorated samium ware, which would also be consistent with the 2nd century date. So now, hold on. Does that mean that the building would be second century or could that be no. fill that's gone in this, this is fill that has gone in to level up this area prior to the construction of this building so it's a very important piece of evidence it tells us our new building predates the one we excavated last year by up to a hundred years and it looked rather different it's almost like a church in its basic um, form the building seems divided with, with, with um, uh, uh, nave and, and aisles. And then on in Trench One, mm. they, we now know that we, well, we think we know that we're going to have a cross range at the west end, such as you see here. But do you think we're actually looking at somewhere that people were living in, or do you think this is just an out hall oh, or something like that? Oh, definitely living in this one. And they're living in, uh, living in so quite sophisticated rooms. Don't forget that sometimes these buildings get very developed over the years. For example, mm. you may find that the aisles get divided and in some cases even get given mosaics. So although it's not as elaborate in construction as last year's, it could still have been a very impressive building. And all the while, Carenza's been scraping away at this end of it in trenches 6A and B. Sadly, she's found no sign of a link to the springs. But by merging the two trenches in the thinnest excavation I've ever seen, she's uncovered the whole of her end of the building. And it's the best looking wall of the dig. This is fairly amazing, isn't it? Fantastic, <laughs> isn't it? Well, this is the building that GF has picked up. As you can see, we've got a wall coming in dead straight here. 90 degree turn, dead straight. Almost too good to all be true. All the way along here. <laughs> And then another 90 degree turn off this way. What's this here? This is roof stone. So this is what the building would have been roofed with. So we're really pleased to discover that because that's a big help in trying to work out what the building looked like. Um, possibly an entrance turning in here. And then the wall picks up again, going the same direction that way, but we're not entirely certain. It's actually the same wall. It's a different width. It looks a bit rougher. Um, that's why we're pleased that we've actually followed this wall because we're really trying to link up with how this building relates to anything that might come up around the spring. And I was concerned that if we just did a section there and then picked it up here, we would have had no idea whether it was the same wall. So if something funny had happened in between, we'd have ended up not understanding the link between the two. And in fact, as it happens, there does seem to be something funny happening in between because we've got this entrance and the wall looks a bit different. Have you got that entrance on the GFU? It does actually show, Tony. That was the corner Crenzi was talking about. Yeah. We follow the wall along and then there's a break at this point we appear to have one block there and then a second block uh, on this side. Uh, and David Neal was talking about two possible tower rooms with an entrance coming through here. A tower room? What sort of building have we got? <laughs> There's like a palace. Well, <laughs> I mean, this, this is, is certainly a villa I think we're dealing with now. The building's stunning metamorphosis from barn to villa has passed unnoticed at the altar factory, where Giles is still frantically chiselling. Chris, our Roman paint expert, is going to make black, red, and the real tester, blue. Right, we need the recipe. 
Well, we've got Vitruvius here, who was an ancient writer, um, who mostly writing for architects. The basic ingredients of Vitruvius's recipe are sand, copper, and soda. These, he says, must be ground together, then moistened, shaped into small balls, and put onto the fire to roast overnight. All this work is for the goddess of good fortune herself, and it feels like she's really on our side. Just as we're packing up after a really successful day's archaeology, she guides us to these beautiful brooches. They were both found in the stream by um, Tim, the metal detector man, yeah. the stream just behind us here. And what are they made of? Well, that's proving a bit difficult. They should be made of bronze, but they've got a very strange colour mm. being in the stream. Yeah, so they've got this calcium deposit mm, on them. They might be made of silver, but certainly this one here has got traces of silver plating, so they would have looked like silver. And what's this on the back? It's like a spring? Well, that's the spring. Yes, that's the spring, and it's been held in place by a little iron pin. They're the safety pin of the Roman world, really. What sort of date are they? They're both late first century. First century? Yeah, so it's early. We have some pottery of roughly the same sort of date, Yes, don't we? a little so, bit of pottery, which you is You know, early. we've got a 400-year span for this site now. That's Great. Very so they're very, not only beautiful finds, they're very useful uh, for yeah, us. Uh, yeah, because it's that early period. Beginning of day three, it's still bitterly cold up here. I don't know what the Romans were doing building on top of this hill, but if the archaeologists are right, then this is the entrance to the villa. But what was inside it, we don't yet know. What do you think, Mick? Well, that, that's what we were just discussing, because I'd rather assumed you came through that door into a courtyard, but David says not. No, I don't think so. I think you came through that door into, into what was effectively like a barn with a, a range of rooms um, on the north side. So, for example, this is the, this is the north side of the building. It's coming, on down, coming down here. You may have a series of division walls coming through here. Then the rooms continuing on, dividing up this aisle. And then more rooms on the other side. That's right. So how are we going to establish that? Well, we're going to, the idea is to put a trench, to extend this trench through here. Back to, back to this to, point here. To make it an L-shaped trench. And that should, we should then resolve uh, whether this really is the entrance and to establish uh, the divisions that we've been thinking about. While the mechanical digger extends trench six at the front of the building, Phil and David have got something to show Mick at the other end, in trench one. That is the, gra the old original ground surface where we think the turf line is. Right. Look at this, it's going down much, much deeper. Yeah. We've had masses and masses and masses of painted wall plaster yeah. in there yeah, that's I've seen gone this. in yeah. there. Yeah. It's going on down. And I mean, David, you reckon it's a cellar? I'm sure it's a cellar, yeah. This is, this is clearly the north wall of the cellar, the wall came presumably comes around here, yeah. turns down here, and comes back here. Well, presumably this is coming from rooms up above, is it, David? No, it could, through. It could, not necessarily, Mick, because it could be coming from the, the walls of the room. Now, that you may think, well, why do you have wall plaster, painted plaster on a cellar? Well, but that's, that's, that's right. Well, that's yeah. right. You've only got wine in your room, <laughs> right. But sometimes these rooms were not just used for um, keeping goods in and yeah. produce. I mean, they had sometimes a quasi-religious significance. Ah, for example, right. there's, the, locally at Whitcomb, yeah. they found painted plaster on the wall of the cellar there and of course the famous example is Lullingstone, is Lullingstone in, Kent, in Kent, yeah. where you yeah. had the the niche with the with the nymphs with water coming out of their right. breasts yeah water producing nymphs are probably beyond even Giles's expertise with the chisel but he's doing a grand job on the altar in the paint shop however Chris is looking worried Chris even I know <laughs> this is not Roman no, no, you're quite right there. We've had a bit of a disaster with the, um, with the, pi with the blue pigment. What happened? Uh, well, we put it in a kiln overnight to get the temperature right. Yeah. And it's um, melted the pot, so it's got up to temperature, but it hasn't gone blue. That is definitely not blue, is it? So we're having to resort to modern methods. While Chris is barbecuing the balls, I've been given the much simpler task of grinding charcoal to make black. That's that. As the balls cool down, Chris sets about making the red pigment from yellow ochre by heating it. And that'll turn red, will it? Yeah, that's the general idea. Sounds dodgy to me, but what do I know? 
Well, it seems to be going already. Now all we need is a little vinegar. How much do I put in? Well, put a, a splash in and then a uh, bit more, a bit more. Let's pour it, pour it, pour it, a bit more in. Yeah, oh, that's right. very red, isn't it? It's yeah. a very nice colour, that. Yeah, well, that'll do, uh, that'll do our lettering, our inscription. How's our blue doing? Yeah, well, yeah, let's have a look. Let's knock it with the tongs and have a look and see. Well, it doesn't seem to have gone blue, does it? It's a little bit grey on the inside, so I think we're going to have to have another couple of goes with the blowtorch on that. It's all going much better down on the site. Tim has plucked yet another beautiful brooch from the stream. Wow, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? Look at the colours in that. The bright orange is quite unusual to have the really bright orange like that. Second century? I mean, the only thing missing is the pin. And something pretty amazing's just surfaced in Trench 6, near the entrance to the villa. <laughs> this is the most fantastic find I think we've ever found. This is so unexpected, I can't believe it. Hang on, let me, it's a bit difficult to see if I just rub a bit of paint on. over it. Can you see that? What? F, I, oh. well, oh, wow. <laughs> well, look at that. What a sound choice of a name to write not, in a block of stone. I'm not sure. We haven't but, got a bit of a C coming through yeah, at the bottom Yeah, we, we seem to have other letters. Actually. <laughs> Sorry, well, yeah. There is a suggestion of a, of a letter just there. No, uh, no, no. <laughs> Phil, is, Phil is perfectly sufficient. Uh, and another, and another <laughs> letter. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think it might be, David? It looks quite well, crude. It's oh, surprisingly. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Phil. It, it, well, I assume that it, it, it's, it's part of a... It's been on, in a war, some is cut inscription, conceivably associated with a, a memorial stone. That is possible. Um, and then clearly it's been demolished and, and the stone has been it, rebuilt into it, it, this. Sort of With the archaeology in great shape, in Mick heads for the incident room, where he hopes the finds oh, will cool. reveal something about life inside our villa. How are you getting on then? Any idea We've got masses day? of stuff, including Samian pottery, coins, a child's earring, and this lot, the wall plaster from the cellar in Trench 1. Lindsay's also had a closer look at the two brooches we found yesterday and has noticed something peculiar. They both seem to have been snapped in half. Um, what, what, deliberately, do you mean? Yes, I think they have been because neither of these are broken where you would expect them to be broken. And that does suggest that they have been thrown into the stream as part of a ritual activity. Really? You ritually kill the objects. Yes, if you yes. break it, you destroy its power. Nobody else can use it and it, it, you've, you've ended it. These brooches are our first real evidence the springs were a focus of ritual activity. They might have been thrown into the system up here, where the springs are said to rise. Lovely. You can take that loose out of there, Kevin. Yeah. And clear through again, I'll go and have a look. Okay. Except Trench 5 is still dry as a bone. At least it gives some... Look at that, Kevin. Look at that. Some more stone down here. What's that? What's that loose slab? It's a bit more flat and stuff only. Oh! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> and you've got water in there. water! Ah. It looks very similar to the culvert down it in does, the other trench, doesn't it? Doesn't it? But does it connect with the culvert in Trench 4 and the outflow by our new villa building back on the main site? If it does, not only are we back on the trail of ritual activity here, but we'll have uncovered the reason people chose to live here in the first place. Well, look, standing up here, Tony, we're looking at the most sheltered spot on this wonderful setting. And for a basic farming community, shelter and the running water we've got coming down past the building are going to be two of the most important priorities. It's really a continuity of the Iron Age farming that we know has been going on, not just on this site, but the whole general area, right back for centuries. I think what you've got to remember as well is you're dealing here with an extended family. It's not just, you know, mum, dad and a couple of children. It's probably two or three generations and all their dependents as well in this great communal structure. And that family would have lived there for, what, about 100 years or so before they decided to move that, up here? That, that's right. Well, the, possibly our family and the, the, the senior man living there, he may have had enough wealth to give himself a position in the local towns, like Sirencester or Gloucester, and that may have allowed him the opportunity to get better off and, and better off over the centuries after that, moving up here eventually once his priorities change. 
I understand you've had a little bit of trouble with the manufacturing of the blue, is that right? Yeah, domestic uh, production has totally uh, <laughs> failed, so we've had to resort to uh, import. So we've got some uh, very expensively imported um, indigo here, which we'll uh, use for the blue But you bar. can assure me that all the other colours have been made authentically? Yes, 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 absolutely, definitely. Excellent. Is there any room for error? Not a lot. <laughs> Don't screw it up, Phil. No, no, yeah. no. <laughs> I don't want to do it. With only a few hours left before the sacrifice is due, they'd better get cracking. Back on the site, the extension to Trench 6 has revealed the two tower rooms the archaeologists hope to find either side of the entrance. And with much finer stonework than the house itself, it looks to Carenza as if they were a later embellishment. But these little rooms in here that were added on, they really look very tiny, almost functionless. Well, I think that's probably, yes, I mean, they're small enough to have a guard or keep a few bits and pieces in, but yes, I think really it's, it's for, it's, it's embellishment, it's to make the building look more impressive, it's to create a very imposing facade for anyone approaching from down here. And the walls are so much better made than the really rather rough walls that we've got there. It's, it's a big step up, instead of just being a, a nice looking farmhouse, you're making it into a really impressive residence. Stuart to Mark. Here Stuart, over. Mark, we're going to put some dye down at the uh, spring source here. Um, can you see whether it comes through at your end? Uh, will do. What is this? Clayton's old Roman pregnancy test. Over. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've got the pucker stuff here. It's drain tracing dye and it's non-toxic. So you can, you can have a taste of it when it comes through. We'll see how well it travels. I'm getting in position. Out. OK, here we go. Wow, look at that. It just explodes in colour, doesn't it's it? absolutely fantastic. Now it's just a question of waiting. I'll give you a bet. Five minutes. Go, I'll go for seven minutes. <laughs> One minute, three minutes, four minutes, until... Hello, Stuart. We have blue water down here. Blue water. Over. Oh, that's fantastic. I mean, we know where the water's coming from. And we know where it's going. But do we? Will it reach the outflow by our villa? Where the archaeologists are feeling very pleased with themselves. A brand new villa is pretty good going for three days' work. I'm a Roman potential buyer of yeah. your villa. Bijou dwelling, yes. You can impress me, can Very you? Very high status. Oh, I can so, see these yeah. lovely uh, great tower That's rooms right, yeah. here. Yeah. This is your entrance, you'd come through. Cobble yeah. entrance Now we open the doors, yeah. which leads us into this aisled hall. It's a bit like a, like a church with a very high roof. How Tim high? Oh, 40 feet perhaps. Wow. Yeah. Like the timber work with at the top. Timber three work. windows along the side. And I've got rooms here? Rooms yeah. to the north, all along that side perhaps. Rooms and along down here. That side of there. And don't forget, all, we're sharing this with, with animals and farm equipment. Yeah. <laughs> what sort of windows did you say? Clerestory windows. What's There's that There's little small windows at the tops of the wall. Just walls. like a church. Church High windows. up in the wall. Yeah. And then here we come down to these apartments at this end. Yes. So imagine then, as you walked across, you would have walked into a room above the cellar. Well, all your living rooms are probably up at this level, you see, because it would have come more or less on a level from the door where we came in. Yeah. So a lot yeah. of it's going on up above us That's here. Right. That's where your main living rooms would be. It's a nice place. Yeah, it's well, beautiful. You know, you fancy it, then? Mm, we got so. planning permission for a new one over on that hill. And a swimming pool. Yeah, and a swimming pool. All right, yeah. I'll live here for about 100 years. Yeah. And then I'll go and live up on the hill. <laughs> So the story of the new villa is complete. There may well have been a very basic house here in the first and second centuries. But in the early third century, it was replaced by the Isled Hall, complete with cellar, we've excavated this week. Then, as the owners accrued more wealth, probably in the mid third century, they added the towers to make an imposing front entrance. But even that wasn't enough for our upwardly mobile inhabitants, because by the end of the third century, they've moved out of here into the really grand villa we excavated last year.
And to cap it all, we've got the final results from the pregnancy test. This is the outflow by Trench 6. Look at this. Oh, <laughs> magic. Yeah. How long did it take then? We Any reckon about it? 12 minutes. 12 minutes. Yeah, right down we here. We were both wrong up there. Mick reckon five, I reckon seven. Yeah. So. 12 minutes, and that's what? 250 metres yeah. maximum? Well, what, we've definitely got the spring head up there. The water's right. bubbling out. We've got right, stone good, lining to it. That's good. the original Roman spring head up there. You're happy about that Absolutely now. happy, yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So these, these culverts down here must be Roman. They've got to be. It's basically an aqueduct system. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So now we feel we've really cracked the whole site. Imagine the imposing 4th century house on the hill with its three courtyards. The old villa down the hill now houses farm workers and slaves. Overlooking the site is a shrine at the head of the water system that probably brought the inhabitants here in the first place. So all that remains now is to give thanks to the goddess who helped us find it all. Where would it have been positioned? Well, somewhere in the house or in the shrine of the house. This is a um, household altar. And would it just have been a decorative altar or would it have been practical? Oh no, no, this, this is a working piece of equipment. And you come and you pour a libation, a sort of family ceremony on the altar. What, in here? Yes, that, that's called the focus and that's where the libation should be poured. Well, I think we ought to uh, say our thanks to the goddess of fortune, don't you? I so. I'm going to mess it up a bit. <laughs> <I'm afraid. laughs> to the goddess of good fortune. The goddess of good fortune. Good fortune. Good fortune. It's gone blue, look! <laughs> it's a miracle! <laughs>